Today, many students go to college with numerous questions about their faith, yearning to know if the seed planted in them as a child is both true and practical. Using the miracle on the road to Emmaus as a model, young adult ministers conversed weekly for three months with college students about the most pressing questions they had about the Catholic faith. As they journeyed together virtually, something amazing happened. Doubts disappeared, fears faded, and Jesus revealed that he is still alive. Hearts Burning Within Us, the latest book from Patchwork Heart Ministry, is a result of that grace-infused conversation. It is the perfect back-to-school gift for recent high school graduates and current college students. Get your copy for them today at patchworkheart.org or by calling 424-704-3278. That's 424-704-3278. Welcome to the Sowing Hope Podcast. This is a show all about implanting hope in our hearts. I'm Bill Snyder, joined by my friend Ann DeSantis. We're glad you're here for our uplifting conversation about faith and how it sustains our hearts through all the seasons of life. Thanks for walking with us. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Sowing Hope. I am Bill Snyder. It's great to be with you as always. And, um, I want to remind you that you can always go to our website, patchworkheart.org. I want to direct your attention to a new website as well. It's patchworkheartradio.org, uh, where you can find uh, all of our podcasts and um, you know a bunch of other great stuff that's media-related and blog-related right there. So you head over to patchworkheartradio.org, and of course, you can head over to our website too, and it's linked there. But uh, check that out, because it's going to be uh, a wonderful spot for you to be able to interact with us. You can leave podcast reviews. You can interact with all of us on the Sewing Hope podcast. It has its own page where you can see all of the episodes, all 171 now, and that we are on. Uh, as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Anne DeSantis. Anne, how are you? Oh, great, great. And uh, I'm especially excited because this is a great episode where uh, not only do we have a colleague, right, someone who's working in ministry, but a good friend of ours. And so we're excited to in, invite and to welcome to the podcast, Carlos Solorzano. Carlos, welcome to Sewing Hope again, because I know you've Thank been you. here it's, before. It's always great to be here. Thank you for having me again. That's right. That's right. We have so much to talk about because you're doing wonderful work and, um, and not only that, I want to let our listeners know that look out for some wonderful collaborative efforts between Patchwork Heart Ministry, HCD Talks, where that's uh, Carlos Salarzano and also Angelica Delalana, our good friend, uh, are in ministry, and me with the St. Raymond Anatis Foundation. We'll be doing a retreat pretty soon, so keep an eye. Uh, but why don't we start out with your story, because that's always a wonderful um testimony of your faith oh goodness well I grew up um I grew up in a I'm a cradle catholic and you know really the strength of my faith has, has always been there in terms of my parents influence and and really encouraging my sister and I to to follow the faith um I didn't realize it growing up because you just kind of live in this bubble to a certain degree but my parents were really good at delivering the, the love of Christ so um it was, it was easier for me, especially when I would hear stories of some friends of mine who had those real hellfire sort of Bible thumping Christian parents where, you know, if you did the dishes wrong and you got a Bible quote over the head over it. So it was really a sense of rebellion just because you were tired of it. And, you know, overall just, you know, I originally had dreams of music and, you know, rock and roll stardom and all that. But um, even when I was trying all that in my younger days, you know, that the faith was always there to the point where it kind of kept me out of trouble and then also sort of had me looking over my shoulder a lot in terms of um, what I really should do with my life. And, you know, I've been teaching theology at the high school level for this is my 25th year, actually, it's been a great year too. And, you know, I've been involved with um, other 
church activities off and on for years. You know, I have I'm married with a couple of kids and, you know, so my family's involved with church, but then, you know, I ended up starting, you know, the HCD ministry with, with Angelica a couple, about two and a half years ago now. And really that's been the big calling besides my career and my family. And to the point where um, people will ask sometimes if I'm still doing music and the answer is yes, but I actually recently just really pulled back in terms of where I perform and how often because I wanted to devote more time to the ministry and to really focus, to be in a better place, um, really physically when I'm performing. Because I mean, a, a performance place is a performance place, but there are some places where it gets a little, let's just say it's a little too much. And I, I just don't want to be in that environment. Yeah. Well, you take your ministry very seriously and yes. your faith. And also you're an author. Now we're going to talk about that yes. too, because I love your book. Thank you. And uh, I can't wait for people to hear about that too. Thank you. Um, is there anything else that you want to share though about your faith journey? Because I know that um, I think you're a deeply spiritual person. I mean, you've Thank shared you. some dreams, some thoughts that you've had with us on other podcasts and how God has spoken to you. Um, anything else that you want to share about that? Um, I would say, I guess I had learned in my theology, of the body studies, how God really is the only Thing that can truly satisfy us in our lives and I've always been a very deep thinker and a deep feeler like I don't just ponder these deep mysteries of the universe I, I really will sit and think about what something means and it's actually made my life very lonely because of the fact that it, it's you don't really meet a lot of people that are like that and sometimes you feel kind of weird whatever but um, I always noticed that when I would go into the depth that depth of myself regarding my faith, that was always where I really found God. I mean, it was like, I didn't have to be afraid to do that. So it's one of those things where I think that's what we all fear the most is we all have that capacity. And again, we can think about um, when you go that deep, what are you going to find? It's like really the mysteries that we're looking for. And that's where I would find God. And, and so um, a lot of my faith journey, it's really, there, there's people will ask me sometimes questions and I'm like, you know, I, I really wish I could tell you, but I can't put it into words. I just, I just feel it. And it, it makes sense to me. And it, it allows me to trust more. Cause I do question everything, you know, everything that, you know, even if it's like your favorite basketball player, your favorite, this and that, you know, I, I was always that kid that asked why. And, and I would stop if you give me a good answer. I didn't just ask why for the sake of being annoying. So I was just, if someone could really give me and even if I disagree with you, a good reason, I'm like, hey, that's that's great. I, I get it. And, and I, I can appreciate that. But I just always I've always been turned off by just when people are just very superficial about everything. I'm like, no, there's so much more. Come on, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. but I just I just that's where it gets to be a very lonely life. But then I would find God in all that. So that was kind of the nice thing, at least for me. But what I love about the Catholic faith is that you have the real cerebral Catholics, you have the very artsy Catholics, you have the very, you know, taught by your grandma Catholics, and it all works. You know, the faith is, is for everybody. Yeah. And that's what's, that's the beauty of it. Yeah, I we can all identify. all come together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, I can identify <laughs> with you so much, Carlos, because I have that same type of spirituality. You know, you might not be able to explain it uh, on, on a page. You just feel it in your gut and you just know that the Holy Spirit is leading you in this direction. And you say, OK, God, I'm going to follow this and I'm going to do this. Um, you know, so I definitely identify with uh, your spirituality because uh, I have a similar one. Uh, I always tell people that our spiritualities are as unique as our fingerprints. So uh, yes. remember that, uh, you know, just because you might have a, you know, gravitate toward a similar uh, spiritual, um, you know, genre, maybe I don't know if that's even a word, but that works. You know, uh, it, you know, you might gravitate toward that. The church is big enough for everybody. And that's the amazing thing about the Catholic church is that, you know, you can have, um, you know, any, any area, um, of, of faith. I mean, you got those real intellectual people like St. Thomas Aquinas, then you've got the mystics like St. Catherine of Siena, right? Like, <laughs> like yeah. you've got a wide range. <laughs> um, but no, so, I mean, I would love for you to talk with us a little bit about your book too, because it, because it's, uh, mm -hmm. a, an amazing, um, walk that you took, um, with, uh, oh, yeah. with the blessed uh, mother, right? Yes. Um, it's called, I am his mother and it started out really, I have this habit of having a little piece of something that will just grab me. 
and then I end up for like not remembering it exactly the way it was. So there's this, you know how there's a million movies named Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and there's one from uh, 1999. And you can find the DVD on Amazon because uh, Jeremy Sisto is the one who plays Christ. And what I love about the film is that the director took a lot. Of, he did take some liberties creatively, but I felt that they really kept the spirit of the film. And I do know that um, they did show it to Pope John Paul II, and he loved it. And the director was very moved by that because, one, it's the Pope. That's the most obvious. But also he was aware of the fact that um, Pope John Paul II was a playwright and an actor. So he understood the fact that the Pope did understand what was going on. But there was this scene that really got to me where Mary Magdalene in the film is following Christ. Like she's like from a distance. She's not, this is all not in the gospel. And there's a scene where she's walking on the lake at night and she, and our blessed mother sitting on the, sh on the lake shore. And Mary Magdalene um, looks at him, looks at her, excuse me, and says, you are his mother. And I, I think she says, yes, I am Jesus's mother. But for some reason, when I remembered her saying that, I, I thought she said, I am his mother. And so that's where the title stuck in my head. And it's a beautiful scene because she tells Mary that he scares her. And, and she says, imagine that a prostitute afraid of a man. And, and our blessed mother's like, there's something about him that's different than any manual. And she keep, like she embraces her to the point where later in the film, she's the one that introduces her to Christ as her friend. So I saw it and like, I loved that movie. I, I loved the interactions he had with her. Um, there was a movie called Mary Mother of Jesus that um, was on NBC years ago. That it was, again, the, the walk between her and, the, and her son. And um What's interesting is, you know, growing up Catholic and then, you know, being Hispanic and my mother has a, oh, my mother has such a deep faith of, for our, you know, with, um, of our blessed mother. She's her devotion to her is just, it's, it's really beautiful. So I kind of had that heart of it there. And I don't know what came over me. I just, one day I just started writing and I, I just played around with it. And I kind of, I, I feel really uncomfortable saying this, but there were just some things that I surprised myself when I wrote it. And, and I think what kind of helped me was while I was writing it, I, I played a lot of Marian songs in the background. I, I played them. Some of them I've just played over and over and over. And, and I would find a version on YouTube that just really got to me. And um, one song was, they had this, I can't remember her name, but there was this young woman who she has a, um, a very, like a very Broadway, like sort of, stage theater voice and she's singing holy is his name and it's it's beautiful because she's she's probably in her 20s but you imagine this young girl mary that she was and it just kind of gave me like the sense of the joy she must have felt when she realized she was she had conceived christ in her womb and so i would just play that all through the first part of the book which which i, I guess i'll talk about the structure of the book right now um i got a little creative with it where the it starts and ends with John the Apostle. So John, of course, was the one who cared for her. So he's just had his revelation, for which, of course, gives us the book of Revelation. And he finds this document that our Blessed Mother had left. It's basically a diary. He did not know she wrote it. This is after she's been assumed into heaven. So he's essentially sharing it with the world. So then the second part is from the Annunciation until the finding in the temple. And um, so, you know, just kind of went, you know, I used the gospel as a guide. I kind of used my heart as well. And what I did was um, I, I have two children and, you know, one is 19, one is 15. At the time they were younger. And I think what I did was I allowed myself to really go deep into my heart as a parent. And, and, I, and I respect the fact that I'm, I'm not a woman. I'm not, I could never know what it's like to carry a child of mine. And I, I respect that. I mean, I've been in the delivery room with my wife. I, I, I understand what that means and I respect that. But I tried to go as deep as I could. And I knew, <laughs> I thought, I know I'm gonna hear about this one, I'll bring that up later. But um, so I just tried to, to really be as, I guess let's use Genesis real quick, naked and not ashamed. Like yeah. show that part of my heart to my kids. So if my kids were ever like, well, how much do you love me, dad? Read this, because this is kind of what I'm, you know. Yeah. 
the next part to sort of break it up, because that's where my music background comes in. You want to break things up, like writing a song and you kind of want to bury it up. I have this idea where imagine if you encountered Christ and he was now ascended to heaven. So who would you talk to? It would be Mary if she was still here. So I took three people that had encounters with him. The rich man who walked away because he had many possessions, the woman caught in adultery, and the man born blind. Mm. And just how his the encounter they had with him affected them later in life. And they wanted to, the, the closest they could tell him was her. So they sought her out to tell her. And so she, of course, responds to them as well. And in a very maternal way where in some ways she gives the last instructions. And I guess the idea I had in mind, it's kind of like when a married couple's having a little bit of a, like a difficult time. And sometimes the wife will go talk to her husband's mother because she knows that man. Oh. <laughs> like, okay, well, let me tell you about your husband. I know he's difficult, but you know, here's a little piece because I, I carry, I mean, you're his wife, but I carried, I, I carried him. I, I know him. So I kind of thought, okay, well, Mary would know, you know, the Catholic church allows us to see Christ through her eyes. So I try to sort of show that in that part. Yeah. The next section was really hard because it's essentially Holy Week. Mm. And I, I hope I can say this with a straight face. Um, that, part, that part of the book was just, it, it, was, it was difficult, but it, it really allowed me to see her courage because you really think about the instinct, especially when he was on the cross, the instinct that she would have had to essentially step push aside because she knew what he had to do. I mean, obviously she would have, any mother would have done whatever they could even offering their own life to save their child. But she understood, you know, her faith to like even trust in the father that, you know, that, that in the end, it's your, your hope will be rewarded. And what kind of, a, what, what guided me emotionally at that part was there's a Spanish song that my mother showed me years ago. It's called El Diario de Maria, where it's kind of like the book in a sense where she's at the foot of the cross and she's remembering all these big parts of his life. And, oh, it's just the song itself is in Spanish. So it's very, it's very emotional. And like people have made videos to it. And the woman that um, the songwriter hired to sing it, she, she, her, she's an angel from heaven. Her, her voice is it just, it's completely it was perfect for the song. So I would just play it over and over on those parts and just try to feel what the song was sharing with me. And, and, you know, the artist was sort of guiding the other artists and it, it was a really, it was a painful and a beautiful experience. And uh, just really allowing myself to just fall into it really. I mean, it's hard to explain. And then, you know, when I got to the part where, you know, of course we're not gonna give specific things away but obviously we know the end of the story. So you always wonder, you know, what was it like for her to see him when he rose from the grave? And so I kind of had my little take on that, trying to use little things that we knew from the Gospels. And then, as I said earlier, John bookends both the beginning and the end. So she's now gone and he's having another vision and kind of notices that there's a lot of things he doesn't understand because he's hearing other languages. He's seeing other people and he starts kind of blurting out the places of the apparitions and has no idea what he's talking about, but he just knows in his heart, her work is not done. Hmm. Mm. Yeah. I, I love your writing style and I love Thank your you. faith. Yeah. And I want you to tell the people now also how they can get it because it's an amazing book. <laughs> well, <laughs> Thank you. It's on Amazon. It's I, called, I am his mother. Uh, my, you know, Carlos Solorzano author, um, my brother-in-law did the cover. He's a graphic artist. It's a beautiful cover where it has a very like sort of mosaic, like old. It is a gorgeous of, cover. <laughs> it, brother -in -law, it was funny because my mother-in-law was like, this is your, this is your sister's husband. Do a good job. It was, it was funny. <laughs> and then um, it's, you know, you can find it on Amazon pretty much. I mean, it, it's there. Um, we're still looking at or trying to find more distribution for it. Um, Angel and I are actually um, working on finishing um, an audio version of the book. So um, that for mm, people who love to listen beautiful. to it instead. Um, so it's interesting because I'm going to be John, you know, because I'm the guy. 
and she she loves the book and she's you know she's a mother of course so she's you know I've I've heard I was I've recorded her myself doing it and like I've heard the way she I mean she sounds like a mom reading her diary she does an amazing mm. job with it so that and then you know we're you know every now and then we're we'll, we're trying to go now that things are slowly opening up um, more conferences like I'm hoping to do it at the CMN next summer because you know we got yes. we all got to hook up there again and, and enjoy <laughs> Chicago. That's right, we had so much fun. Yes, yeah. and then um, I have for those in Arizona, that's where I, I live. I've been to the Marion Conference in Scottsdale a few times, and I, unfortunately, they didn't do it this year and last year. And that's where I've I've had a lot of success with it, and that's what I was kind of I was gonna I was kind of referring to earlier. So. I would be there for a few days. So like I'd be at my table and some women would buy it and it was kind of, kind of curiosity. And then they'd come back to my table the next day. Like I started reading your book last night and I started getting nervous because some of them were like, yeah, you know, I'm a grandmother. I had six kids and I have 12 grandkids and I'm going to see if you got this right. And um, a lot of them were like, Hey, you know, I'm, I will say for a, a guy, you got it. And my mom loved it. So to me, that was the ultimate. Oh, that's a big, thing <laughs> yeah so i because that was the one i was worried about and and but she she loved it and so it's been real popular with moms and uh with those who love our lady and, and awesome. the thing that i i was very happy with is my mother had actually given it to some um protestant women and they said they saw a picture of mary that they never knew so mm -hmm. that, that was something you know as a catholic always trying to you know share our blessed mother with people it was that was something I was really happy to hear. I'm really excited for people to get your book and read it and share it and share it. <laughs> uh, Seth, that's a great thing. Now, what about possible other books for the future? Are you working on anything else? I am. Well, I have that. Su I have the supernatural series that we're we the part one's already out. It's called Through Time and Eternity. It's a it's kind of weird. Um, I was watching. It was funny. I was watching this televangelist on TV one day and he had this. He, you know, he said that famous thing of, you know, we're all sinners and we all crucified Christ. You know, I crucified Christ. You know, it's a theological idea. And I had this weird idea one day where what if someone had to actually go back in time and do it? Physically do it, which it, it, and, and the idea turned out to not I didn't follow that idea. It ended up turning into a what if the fallen angels decided to go back in time to try to stop it? Oh, I remember you telling us this before. <laughs> yeah, so there's that. And so that's a, that's one story. And I use a lot of angelic folklore and scripture. And the second one is sort of, well, what happened to the hero after that story? And then I'm, I, I haven't started the third one yet. It's kind of outlined, but part of it's just, I want to step away from it. And then part of it is just, I, I'm still, I need time to just sort of, you know, process. But actually, this is, I'm actually really excited to do this right now because I have yet to say any, I have yet to post this or say this publicly, but the thing I'm working on right now is Angel and I are going to together, we're working on this trilogy and it's, you know, when you hear about philosophers, anyone from like Ayn Rand to Nietzsche, how they would write novels to sort of share their ideas. We're putting together this series, this three part thing. It's pretty much outlined where it's, like a love story slash family story slash, you know, people story. And it essentially is, it's faith, hope, and love. And it's going to have all these elements of theology, of the body going through it, where you'll have one couple where it's sort of the ideal relationship of the other couple, where it's going to be more of like, they've gone through a lot in their lives. And a lot of times people think when they've done that, that they're gone, they've, they're gone too far down the wrong road or that they cannot be redeemed. Not true. And of course, then later the influence that that would have on later generations. So um, I'm like, I kind of will put stuff together and then she kind of adds things, doing it through a Google document. So it's kind of a collaborative thing. And it's something I'm really excited about because, you know, I'm, I'm taking all these concepts from TOB and putting it in there. And then the good thing is that she just finished her first part of the Creighton model for NFP. I we're know putting it, we're putting it in the story in, in the, Oh secret. my gosh, we're going to put all these things and showing how it all works in the real world. Mm, so that's so making it challenging to write, but it's also like, we have to do this. We have to do this. And, and see, that's amazing. And I think, you know, again, through novels too, right? Like through fiction, the truth of the faith can be dramatized. Mm -hmm. And 
when you dramatize it and you make it, I think we're seeing a lot of success with the chosen. Like I know how mm-hmm. many people have been watching that series because it's dramatized and it's yes. made uh, to entertain. And, you know, I, I think a lot of times we forget and you do a great job of reminding us that Jesus and the biblical characters uh, were emotional beings. They yes. were not just, you know, they're not just, you know, you know, words on a page. They actually lived lives in times and drawing on those experiences and bringing that out into the modern day and continuing the story, writing it in an engaging, entertaining way, uh, ends up saving souls just because uh, people stumble across this and they go, Oh, wow. You know, just like you're mentioning the Protestants, you know, here, here they go, you know, with the blessed mother, there you go. It's like mm-hmm. one of the biggest stumbling blocks. Well here, let's write it emotionally. Let's take it yes. uh, so that, so that you can see this in this dramatized form and realize that, yeah, this is true. And it's funny because the movie I was citing earlier, um, and it's funny because it's the year of St. Joseph. Some of the scenes in that film between Jesus and Joseph are. Because <clears throat> even after he's gone and he actually has a conversation about him with Mary Magdalene, talking about how amazing of a father he was to him. Mm. It's just and it's funny because it's like, you know, you, you mentioned that they were emotional people. They were human beings. Yeah. You know, they had the same feelings we have. And it's just, you know, we when we take a look at it, and, and, and the reason also why I love that particular film with Jeremy Sisto is because they make Jesus very human, like like he laughs and he starts a water fight with the apostles. So when he dies, I mean, it's certainly not as intense as the Passion of the Christ, but it's heartbreaking because you really like him. Like you, you see how he treats people and it makes sense. And so like at his resurrection, like um, John, of course, was always seen as the younger apostle. And like there, there's just things about like, like the smile he has with Jesus. Mm-hmm. And like when he's with the, the apostles in the upper room, like this is part towards the end. I, I love it where he's standing there. His hand is down. And remember, John was the one he, he went to the grave and like he was convinced Jesus rose. He's just holding his hand. And like the actor they got to play John for that, just for that scene alone, it was Mm. perfect. So it's like, and of course we're all different learners. You know, some of us love to read, some of us are visual. So for those visual learners, you know, that, and like Pope John Paul II said, he goes, give me artists, I will save the world. Mm. Yeah. 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 It's just, I mean, we have, I mean, we walk into churches and we see, you know, like my wife's a convert. And I remember before she became Catholic, we would walk into um, churches because she'd go to mass with me and she's, she would just kind of shake her head and say, yeah, these newer churches, they just don't get it. This is not a church. This is a theater. Mm-hmm. And so when she's in mm-hmm. the older churches and just, she's like, okay, this is a church. And she was saying that before she was Catholic. I mean, she just, she understood the point of sacred art and then the music and, you know, like when we hear the Gregorian chants and we hear like the, the, the choir pieces, like there's a gentleman out here in Tucson, Carlos Sapion, where he he's a he's the composer for the cathedral here. And he he wrote oh, he wrote this Ave Maria himself, his own version. And it was beautiful. It was just he does it during like the certain concerts he'll do. And he's a trained tenor. He's a trained composer. And he gives it back to God. And it's a beautiful version of Ave Maria. It's just wow. It's just, you know, I, I, when I was in Philadelphia and I went to the Basilica, you know, I'm from the West Coast. I mean, we don't have churches like that out. You know, they don't, I had, it took yeah. me like an hour to walk from the, to the altar. And I'm just looking around and I'm like, oh my goodness, this is beautiful. It just took my breath away. It really is. I actually used to do tours there. My daughters and I worked as volunteers. So I know exactly what you mean when you say it's breathtaking mm-hmm. and the work that went into it. So when you come to Philadelphia, we have to go back. Oh, yeah. I, I, yeah. I want to go to Mass there. I just kind of visited mm-hmm. as a tourist. But, and it's funny because a long time ago, when my book was, uh, when this, the, I Am His Mother was on, with another publisher, it was actually stocked at the gift shop there for a while. 
It's just, no. I haven't been able to get in touch with the gentleman who runs it, but it was there. I had it, I had it there and I had it at the uh, St. Mary Providence retreat center. So I, I, I've had my books in Pennsylvania. I got to see about, I got to find some other places to see where they might have be able to stock it. But I mean, you know, we're definitely on top of it. You know, that was another reason why I made some changes in my life because some of the, I, I can spend more of this time trying to, you know, network, you know, cause angels rosaries are just beautiful. And then we have other stuff we're working on and other things. And, so, you know, we want to, you know, be able to get that out, you know, to different places and, mm. and, you know, the more traveling we do, the better, like, for example, we were not only in Chicago and saw some beautiful churches there, but when Bill mentioned Marytown and we both walked in there and our jaws hit the floor, it was just, <laughs> I, yeah. I, her and I still talk about that place. It, it, it yeah. I mean, wow. we're planning on going back. So, um, Thank you, Bill. That was, oh, no. oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> was yeah. yeah. Well, when you live there for 18 months, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. like amazing. it's home. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's home. But no, thank this has you been so, so much far. Fun. This podcast has been awesome with all of that you're sharing. You know, we have to have like a part two because um, <laughs> unfortunately we're almost out of time. Yeah. It's, it's um, a basically like a half hour, 40 minute podcast. Sure. So as we're coming to a, a close pretty soon, um, is there anything else that you want to share about what's going on with ministry? Um, we're, it's, it, well, we're, we've been blessed because like uh, we've had two bishops uh, give their public approval of it. Her mm, regional bishop. In, yes, her regional bishop in the Los Angeles, uh, San Pedro region. And then my bishop of Tucson, which that was a blessing because he told us straight up, I do not give public endorsements. I will just say, I'm okay with it. And then you can tell people in the diocese, I'm okay. And they can call my office. He, oh, he, he went ahead and did it. So I was, I was mm, blown away by that. That's a big deal. Yes. Um, we've been contributing weekly to, there's this thing called the new outlook. It's the diocesan, well, it's not a newspaper anymore, but periodical, which is nice. We're currently working on a number of videos for n- n- numerous uh, parishes and schools that are going to have us do like a lesson. And i um, I think there's a lot of TBD to tell you because I'm meeting with tomorrow morning with a former student via Zoom. He's up in the Phoenix area. He's a principal at a Catholic school. It's kind of bizarre because he was the, one of the first class I taught. He's now a principal. I told him once ago, I should come in for an interview so you could like actually fire me because I gave you detention when you were freshmen. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he, he's been talking to me about, um, about coming up to do some talks for the school talking about bringing Angel in possibly too for us both to do a talk for the parents. And uh, she actually is now the NFP person at her parish, one of the NFP instructors for the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. She's creating a thing, a talk for the girls at her parish school. This other parish school in Tucson wants to bring her in. My school wants to bring her in. My wife's school is talking about bringing her in. I mean, she is gonna be the NFP person on the that's the a South. big deal yes it really and is so pray passionate for her. about it and she this is something that she's been not it's been, it's been like tugging at her for a couple of years now and so we're excited because in, in like the way she kind of worried i'm sort of paraphrased she goes you know i want to teach women who they really are and then i want to come in and do the theological lesson where i can tell them this is how men are supposed to see you as designed by god do not settle for anything less Mm. Mm. beautiful you know there's so much more to come i mean so i want the 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 listeners the audience to know that this is not like the last time you're going to hear from carlos (laughs) on patchwork (laughs) card ministry right exactly or the st raymond onatis foundation either where i'm the director (laughs) so okay um but thank you so much for being a guest now i as i said at the beginning there's going to be some good news coming to with our three ministries. We're going to yes. be doing something in 2022. And the great news is it's going to be an in-person event. So yes. keep an eye. It's going to be in the Philadelphia area. We're working out all the details and, you know, what the title is going to be and, and exactly where we're going to have it. But um, keep an eye on a couple different websites, uh, nonatus.org, which is the St. Raymond Nonatus Foundation, hcdtalks.com, and also patchworkheart.org. There are the places that you want to look for it. Thank you yes. so much Thank again. You. And I'm excited because 2022 will mean I have not been to Philadelphia in five years and I miss going there. I used to go there for my Theology of the Body Institute courses. So I always enjoyed going to the Philadelphia area. So 
And you have friends here now too. So. Uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> I have in-laws there too. I just haven't seen them in forever, but my, my wife's family, her dad's side's from there. So. Oh, oh okay, nice. good. Yeah, so we'll, we can probably see about some of them coming out to the thing too. So we'll hopefully. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, awesome. uh, this has been so much fun. Thank you, Thank uh, you. To, to both of you. And uh, until next time, from all of us here at Patchwork Art Ministry, I'm Bill Snyder. Keep beating to your Catholic heart and sowing hope into those broken hearts. Thanks for listening to this episode of Sowing Hope on Patchwork Heart Radio. For more information about this podcast and our ministries, visit our websites, patchworkheart.org and andesantis.com. You can also follow and interact with us on Twitter at PWH Ministry or Andy Santos 2. Today, many students go to college with numerous questions about their faith, yearning to know if the seed planted in them as a child is both true and practical. Using the miracle on the road to Emmaus as a model, young adult ministers conversed weekly for three months with college students about the most pressing questions they had about the Catholic faith. As they journeyed together virtually, something amazing happened. Doubts disappeared. Fears faded, and Jesus revealed that he is still alive. Hearts Burning Within Us, the latest book from Patchwork Heart Ministry, is a result of that grace-infused conversation. It is the perfect back-to-school gift for recent high school graduates and current college students. Get your copy for them today at patchworkheart.org or by calling 424-704-3278. That's 424-704-3278.